Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we're going to be talking about even more natural toxins. Today we're going to be talking about mycotoxins that are found in molds. And so the first one that we're going to talk about is called T2, or sometimes referred to as T2 mycotoxin. And this mycotoxin is found in several Fusarium species, and it's a member of the Trichothecene family of mycotoxins. It's interesting to note that Fusarium fungi can contaminate grains, such as barley, wheat, and oats. And it's possible that people and animals can get exposed to this because we're going to be ingesting wheats, grains, etc. And so there's always going to be some small amount of uh, mycotoxins such as this that we're going to be consuming. And so it has a lethal dose of one milligram per kilogram of body weight. And so it's estimated that Europeans in general are uh, exposed to 12 to 43 nanograms per kilogram of body weight per day. And so the levels that are tolerated are much higher than this, but Europeans uh, in general have had uh, dietary amounts measured in the past. So it's interesting to note that when you're exposed to it, you can get symptoms such as vomiting, diarrhea, skin rash, itching, blisters, bleeding, and shortness of breath. It's definitely uh, not something you want to get exposed to. You can see here this corn is absolutely terribly moldy. You'd look at that and you'd probably know better than to eat it. The toxicity of T2 is due to its epoxide group, so I've kind of highlighted it here. And if we look at the T2 mycotoxin itself, it's definitely got an interesting scaffold. It has a cyclohexane group, as well as a couple acetate groups, as well as this uh, elongated ester group. We also have a bicyclic system of, of this here, where we have a an interesting group with a hydroxy group sticking off as well. And so you can see there's a lot of potential points where this or maybe the hydrolyzed versions of this molecule would be able to interact with a bunch of different groups in your body. It's interesting to note that its toxicity comes through the inhibition of protein synthesis, which starts creating all sorts of problems for your cells. Now, the next one we're going to talk about is diacetoxyserpinol. And it's interesting to note that this one is found in the Fusarium genus, and it previously went by a different name for this specific uh, species. And it's also considered by the USDA as a select agent. And if you've never heard of a select agent before, select agents are biological agents or toxins that have the potential to pose a severe threat to both human and animal health, to plant health, or to animal and plant products. So I wasn't familiar with this term prior to doing research for this episode, and so it's kind of an interesting thing to note. Also here we can see that this structure looks quite similar to T2 as well. You can see the only difference here is we don't have an ester group sticking off, so quite interesting. Um, it's also interesting to note that it has similar effects to the other trichothecene mycotoxins. Now the next one we're going to talk about is beta-nitropropionic acid, also known as beta-nitropropionic bonoic acid, and this is found in anthrin anthrinium. Um, and so this is also a potent mycotoxin. In this case, its toxicity occurs through being a mitochondrial inhibitor. And so the specific target of the mitochondrial inhibition is through the inhibition of succinate dehydrogenase. So it can occur as a mycotoxin infecting crops such as sugarcane. And there's been several incidences where many people were negatively affected uh, as they were exposed to really high levels of beta-nitropropionic acid. It's interesting to note that this is a relatively simple molecule, so it's surprising that this is as toxic as it is. Um, symptoms of exposure include respiratory distress, lack of coordination, muscular weakness, abnormal methemoglobin levels, as well as death. And the lethal dose in rats is 68 milligrams per kilogram. The next compound we're going to talk about is patulin, and I think this is a kind of interesting looking one. It's a nice small molecule. We have an alpha-beta unsaturated group as well as a beta, uh, alpha-beta-gamma-delta unsaturation, um, but we also have a hemiacetal group, which is kind of interesting. And so this is found in various molds, including aspergillus, penicillium, and others, and patulin is frequently found in apples and apple products specifically, although it can also occur in other fruits. Now, patulin is genotoxic, although it causes several other toxic effects, which you definitely would want to avoid. And here in this picture, you can see that there's something starting to take over this apple. And you can see that this next apple is absolutely disgusting. And so you can imagine that if there's some contaminated apples, which there will inevitably be in big scale processes, it'll definitely contaminate the final consumer product. So the one thing I've taken away from doing a lot of research for this episode is molds are kind of everywhere. And if you have a sketchy looking fruit or vegetable, it's probably better to not eat it. It doesn't necessarily mean that any weird abnormalities in a fruit are the consequence of an infection with a mold or a fungus or some other pathogen. Um, sometimes weird deformations, abnormalities can occur through nutrient deficiencies. I uh, worked in a tomato farm at one point in time, and let me tell you, there's a lot of potential nutrient deficiencies that can make tomatoes look weird. And so I would still say it's better to go on the safe side if you have alternative options available to not eat weird looking uh, abnormal 
blotched fruit. Um, although some are definitely safe to eat, and sometimes you can cut off the affected area. So in the case of patulin, some of its toxic effects include acute neurotoxicity, teratogenicity, immunotoxicity, and it also has several other modes of subacute toxicity. So let's talk about the biosynthesis of patulin. I haven't covered biosynthesis very much on this channel, and so I thought it would be worth including at least one here. So starting with 6-methyl salicylic acid, it's able to be decarboxylated to give us metacresol. We are then able to undergo a hydroxylation at the benzylic position, followed by a subsequent orthohydroxylation to give us this 1,4-hydroquinone. This can then be oxidized to a benzoquinone type species, and epoxidation can occur at that alkene, giving us this epoxide. This epoxide is then going to be cleaved, so this CC bond is going to get cleaved, and so this compound and neopatulin both have the same number of carbon, hydrogens, and oxygen. And so this is able to undergo a rearrangement to give us neopatulin, which is almost at patulin. You can see the only difference is we have a hemiacetal at this left carbon instead of at this right one. So first what has to happen is the reduction of this acetal, which is basically just a masked aldehyde, to a diol, which is asclodiol. And asclodiol can then be oxidized at the other hydroxy group to give us patulin. So quite straightforward, and it's definitely interesting to see such a small molecule taking very many steps to uh, synthesize. And so the next compound we're going to talk about is alpha toxin B1. And so alpha toxin B1 is found in aspergillus molds. And so here's a couple examples of species containing it. And alpha toxin B1 is a really potent car carcinogen with a toxicity of, uh, of 3.2 micrograms per kilogram per day in rats. And so a lot of the time when the studies have been done on these mycotoxins, they've been done on other animals, and then we just draw conclusions for those uh, effects in people, kind of similar to drug development. Now, if you're trying to develop a drug to treat a disease in people, maybe at some point you're going to want to get people to start taking that drug to see if it works. But when we're looking at toxicity, it isn't really good to just like dose people with a known toxin. That's not something that we like to do. So most of these studies in animals are just um, used to infer their effects on humans. And so it's commonly a contaminant in animal feed as well as food that we eat, such as peanuts and corns. Uh, and it also has a lot of other toxic effects in general. I didn't even try summarizing them here because this just does so many terrible things. Now, the interesting thing here is that we have a dihydrofuran motif as well as another dihydrofuran motif. And it's quite surprising to me that this middle C single bond C isn't readily oxidized to a C double bond C. Uh, additionally, we have a benzene ring with an O group in the meta positions, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then we have a six membered ring as well as a five membered ring fused onto it. So quite an interesting looking molecule. And it's unfortunate that it has as much toxicity as it does. Now, the next one we're going to talk about is sterigmatocytin. Sterigmatocytin. I practice saying that one a lot of times, and I apologize if I butchered it. Um, it's found in aspergillus, and it can be found in moldy food, but it's interestingly also found in water-damaged buildings. So you can imagine drywall or something being affected with it. Now, I couldn't find a good picture of a of drywall affected specifically with uh, this type of uh, aspergillus mold that was producing sterigmatocytin, and so I just included uh, a picture here of the microbes. So uh, this compound is structurally similar to alpha toxins, which we were just talking about in alpha toxin on the previous page, um, although sterigmatocytin is reported far less frequently. So alpha toxins get all of the attention, and uh, even though aspergillus also produces the alpha toxins, um, it just so happens that this Steric matocytin is reported a lot less frequently, although it's probably occurring in uh, small amounts no matter what. So you can see that this is kind of similar. We have the three oxygen groups off of this benzene ring, except instead of having um, you know, a six-membered ring with an oxygen there with a fused five-membered ring over here, we have instead a xanthone motif. So we have a ketone, a benzophenone, except there's also an ortho-oxygen connecting both of the benzene rings together, which is usually called a xanthone. So that's kind of interesting. Um, similar to alpha toxin B1, it's a carcinogen, and it's just really bad overall. It has a lot of different modes of toxicity. So the next one we're going to talk about is Fusa proliferin, and Fusa proliferin is also found in Fusarium molds, uh, although this one's an emerging mycotoxin. So this one was discovered more recently, and so it's only starting to get attention. And so it's known to be a teratogen, it's known to be toxic in general, although all of the modes of toxicity aren't as well understood. And so, interestingly, if we look at the structure here, we can see we have this big ring system. Normally, we have macrolactones. In this case, this isn't a macrolactone, so we just have several different olefins, um, just all bound through a carbon-containing system. Although, we also have a cyclopropenone uh, motif, which is kind of interesting. So, 
most of the time when you have big macrocyclic systems like this, their toxicity occurs through some sort of interaction with the cytoskeleton, although that's not always the case. Here you can see we have a hydroxy group. Presumably this ester is just a prodrug. This will get cleaved off and then somehow it interacts um, with some portion of the cell. So it's an interesting structure and I like this one because normally you expect to see macrolactones for these types of uh, macrocycles, although in this case that's not the case. Now the next one we're going to talk about is fumonisin B1, and fumonisins are a family of mycotoxins. There's several different um, analogs, there's B1, B2, B3, and B4, although B1 seems to be the most well studied. And it turns out that fumonisin B1 is both hepatotoxic and nephrotoxic, so it can affect your liver as well as your kidneys. And as stated earlier, fusarium molds predominantly infect corn, and so here you can see some corn that's been infected, definitely doesn't look great. And fumonisins mimic sphincosine and inhibit ceramide synthase. And so if you look up the structure of sphincosine, which I haven't included here, it looks a little bit similar. And um, Wikipedia has a really good image kind of showing the interaction of various molecules um, with ceramide synthase. So it has to do with this NH2 and this OH group here. This is predominantly believed to be part of the motif that interacts with uh, that enzyme. Um, and some of the other fumazins just have slight tweaks to the structure, that, but relatively uh, look similar otherwise. Okay, and so the last thing I want to say about this is that exposure to fumazin B1 can prevent folate uptake in embryos, and that's definitely something that you want to avoid. It can also cause esophageal cancer, and so that's just cancer in your esophagus. It's not just cancer, it's cancer. It's something you'd ideally like to avoid. Now, if you like deepening your understanding of science, you should check out today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and app that lets you learn interactively with a catalog of over 60 courses for people of all ability and knowledge levels. Brilliant has courses in many areas of STEM, including science, math, and computer science. Brilliant features courses with clear and intuitive explanations to help you actually understand the topics at hand. One course that you might want to check out is their course on chemical reactions. This course provides a straightforward introduction to chemistry that features beautiful illustrations and some of the main concepts in chemistry. Brilliant is offering 20% off an annual subscription to the first 200 viewers of this channel. You can get started today by visiting brilliant.org slash that chemist. I want to thank Brilliant for their support of this channel. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. It would really help out this channel if you left a like and subscribed, and I hope you have a great day. Avoid mold. Be bold or else your body may fold, and you I shall scold.